Well, good morning. As people continue to come in, let's stand together and begin worshiping the Lord this morning. I see that we have a few new folks. If you see somebody you don't recognize or whose name you don't know, just introduce yourself. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. And maybe I should, maybe we've known each other for 10 years, but do it anyway. Say hi to everybody. We, we welcome our visitors. It's very nice to have you with us. We have a gift for you out in the lobby if you want to go by and pick that up. Let's sing together. Loosen it up. Loosen it up. There are calisthenics involved with this song. We have some folks who have been working very hard this week and doing a fabulous job at High Point, bringing the kids in, giving them the gospel, giving them the message of courage that the scriptures teach. A couple of them are going to help us out with this next song. This is a song the children have been learning, and it is pure D scripture. So if you learn this song, you have memorized a verse for the day. Who do we have up here? If any kids want to come up, they can come up. If, hey, kids, if, if you want to come up and help us out, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. No pressure. <laughs> you know, you, you might have to stay with her. Come on up. There you go. Right down there is fine. Or you can come on up. Nice, nice. Any of the other helpers want to join us? Any of the other helpers? We have had a, a, an army of helpers and an army of kids here. 
and it's just been amazing and wonderful to see. So, this next song, you don't know it, catch on fast, and let's sing it together. You have to smile like her. <laughs> Haven't I commanded you? Haven't, Haven't I commanded you? you? Be, be strong, strong and courageous. And do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. Be strong and courageous. fun. Thank you very much for joining in. The kids have been learning that song and getting their scriptures and learning all about what it means to be courageous in the Lord. And uh, just if you get a chance to talk with somebody who's been involved, just really, really jump on that boat and, and find out how, how things are going. Also, I just want to recognize we have a whole crowd of people here who just got back from West Virginia, right? <laughs> Building building a house, doing, I think, if, as I understand it, all the interior work. So talk to them, too. The Lord is doing good things among us, and I'm just very, very pleased. Let's continue singing together.
day announce the Lord has saved us. Tell every nation on earth the Lord is wonderful and does marvelous things. The Lord is great and deserves our greatest praise. He is the only God worthy of our worship. Other nations worship idols, but the Lord created the heavens. Give honor and praise to the Lord whose power and beauty fill his holy temple. Tell everyone of every nation Praise the glorious power of the Lord. He is wonderful. Praise Him and bring an offering into His temple. Worship the Lord, majestic and holy.
with them all the time. They plague us. They weigh us down. On our better days, we'd love to see those weaknesses just eradicated from our lives. And on our worst days, we embrace them. Dear God, we want to see them stripped away. We know that you love us. We know that you love us just as we are, but we know that you are working in us a change. You are tinkering away at our hearts, renewing us by the power of your grace, by the power of your love. Dear God, put it in our hearts this morning to give ourselves entirely, body, soul, heart, and mind to you. Put it in us to hold nothing back. We're bringing you an offering this morning, and, and that's a thing. We obey you in bringing it. We feel a lack in bringing it because we know that you are so worthy. You are so great. There's only so much we can do being limited human beings. But God put it in our hearts to bring it to you out of generosity and good cheer. And we thank you for the love that you extend to us. We don't, we don't pay for it. We know we can't afford it. But we are grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Ushers, please. doing something that's a little offbeat. Paul, do you care if I put you on the spot? You don't? Come on up. <laughs> I promise it'll be painless. 
Jess's microphone on? So here's what I'd like you to do. In a brief space of time, walk us through how to start a fire. I've never done that before. Briefly, you mean? <laughs> how to start a fire. Um, first, you need to start with very fine material, materials that will catch a spark or a, a, a small flame very easily. And then you gradually move to uh, larger materials, making sure that they're dry, that they're prepared. Uh, if they're not prepared, they're not going to catch that spark. They're not going to carry that flame. You need to make sure that uh, there are, I have a couple of kids here floating around a couple places. We talked about the fire triangle. There's three elements that you have to have to have fire. One is you have to have fuel. There has to be something there that can be burned. You have to have heat or some sort of a fire source, a flame. And you have to have oxygen. If any one of those three aspects is missing, you will not wind up with a fire and it will be gone. So you have to nourish that fire. It starts out as a very small flame. You continue to delicately and gently add those larger materials on. Uh, if you add materials too quickly, you will smother the fire and it will be gone. So it's just a gradual process of building until you get to a large sustainable fire that can continue to take fuel readily and continue to burn. Nice. That was very succinct, right? On the spot. He didn't know this was coming. I've seen people blow on a fire. But that never made sense to me because a fire needs oxygen and I'm blowing carbon dioxide on it. What's up with that? Well, you're moving the oxygen. Oh, molecule. just any yeah. oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're I welcome. appreciate it. Thank you very okay. much. I was going to do that. I was going to try to describe how to start a fire. And I thought, you guys are all experts. And, and here's a real expert. He did just teach a class to the kids about how to start a fire. And I think he told them to do it safely. So don't worry too much. Um, <laughs> We had a, a burn barrel when I was a kid, a, um, a, a barrel out back that we would take our papers out into and, and burn. And, and of course, if there's a wind, what? what? Oh boy. You know, I had this in my head during the whole last song, and then, and then I, I, I wanted to embarrass Paul, and, and that just drove everything. Children, you have a special service. If you want to follow Miss Amy, she'll take you to it. I am so glad to be a source of amusement for so many. It just does my heart good to know that people get some joy out of life. Oh, boy. Anyway, any of you still use a burn barrel? Right? A couple of you do. Sure, sure. We, um, we were taught to be very careful that we didn't want to do this when there was... Uh, a wind, or you know, it, it mattered less if the barrel was half full. We could we could do the we could do it that way, but um, we'd go out back and get our papers in there. That's some of that thin, easily ignitable material that Paul was talking about. Um, if you have ever started a fire, in our passage today, you know what Paul is talking about. If you've never started a fire, just follow Paul's instructions and you'll, you'll do great. You treat it very gently at first, very intentionally, turning it just so, keep it out of the breeze. The most flammable fuel just above the little flame that just got started, you get it going. If, you go, if it goes out, you might be able to salvage it with a little ember you might be able to get something in there, blow just a little bit, get it going again. That's the image Paul is painting for us. The gifts that Timothy, his protege, had were evangelism and leadership, perhaps apostleship, serving in Ephesus, where Paul left him before going off to Rome and being arrested and put into prison. This is what it says in 2 Timothy 1. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, 
and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave us, the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Paul's going away. He's leaving Timothy to lead the church. Before he went away, he laid hands on him. That is, he extended a blessing to the degree that he could bring the power of God into Timothy and into his upcoming efforts. His blessing would have included a prayer for gifts from the Holy Spirit to be imparted on Timothy for the work that he was launching on. That's what laying on hands is. And then Timothy had work to do. The Ephesian church where Paul left him was already a vital and powerful church, but Timothy was left there to develop it, to continue its growth, to help it stabilize, to expand its teaching ministries, to put leaders in place and help the people mature in the faith. And Timothy was there for a long time, probably years. We don't get the impression, though, that Timothy felt entirely up to the job. For good reason. Especially following somebody like Paul. He probably felt a little inadequate. The suggestion right here in this text is that Timothy was kind of timid. He was self-conscious about sharing the faith. We know that he was kind of young and, and insecure in his youth. He battled temptations that were common to young men. He could get baited into a quarrel. He had health problems. He was tired sometimes of the work. And we get the barest suggestion that he was even thinking about abandoning the work from time to time. And in these ways, Timothy was not so much different from us. He had a godly background, his mom, his grandmother. He had ability, he had training. But more than that, he had, from the laying on of Paul's hands and the blessing that Paul spoke into his life, a spark. A spiritual ember. In spite of his reluctance, he had to do something about it. So along with Paul talking to Timothy, I want to tell you this morning, fan the flame. Fan the flame. You see, I see a very strong parallel between what we've been doing here at Community and what Paul is talking about with Timothy. I am delighted to see how many of our folks have given time and energy to doing the work of God in an intensive way over the past couple of months. Folks from our congregation have reached into two foreign countries, two distant states, and last week and next week right here in our local church and into our local children to share the good news of the kingdom of God with folks who needed to see it, who needed to hear it. Listen, you may not have been noticing how many people have been involved in these things, but when I do the math, I come up with at least a quarter, possibly as many as a third of our congregation have been involved in these intensive ministries. And that includes another group that's going into a third foreign country early next year. Some of you have seen the fruit of these ministries. You saw people respond to the gospel or to the kindness that was shown to them. Allowing the Holy Spirit to use you and use them. You saw folks impacted by generosity and sometimes a clear presentation of the gospel. Some folks were adults, some were youth, some were children. It's safe to say that people from most of the age groups represented in our church intensively did the work of God using the gifts God gave under the blessing of this congregation over the last few months and in a few months to come. 
when we could, we as a congregation extended a special blessing to these folks. Grace given to them, launching into their endeavors. We prayed for the work, the people toward whom the work was extended. We prayed for the people doing the work. And we prayed for empowerment and safety and the preparatory work of God to go before them. You did that. The flame has been ignited. The embers are glowing. Some of you in this room were on those recent missions. Some of you might have had deeply spiritual interactions with some people. You heard the voice of God in ways that you've never heard Him before. You went with the blessing of your brothers and sisters here, and you came back changed. Maybe you feel like the change isn't so profound or so deep, and maybe it was just a suggestion of something for you to consider. But it's there, and it's new. And it's not yet been washed out by the world's noise or by your own rationalization or Satan's voice. God spoke, and you're still looking at the ember glowing there. And wondering what it means. I'm not just talking to people who had an unusual experience this summer. Many people right here in the congregation have been plugging away week by week doing the work they've always done. You've been faithful in the performance of your duties. You have known deep in your heart that what you do is a ministry and a calling. You've conducted worship or you've led meals or called sick people or organized classes or fixed things or crunched numbers. Or, or pushed buttons, or you conferred among the other leaders of the church. You might be like Timothy. You might be a little tired, feeling a little inadequate, feeling like you don't quite fit the bill. But like Timothy, you've shouldered the load and you've tried your best, or maybe, maybe you think you could do better. Or maybe you've been on the sidelines. Maybe when you were given a book that encouraged you to discover your gift of the Spirit, you were a little reluctant. Maybe you thought it was a ploy to put you to work. Maybe it means they're going to enlist me for a job. But so what if that's what it is? You're a child of God. You're a disciple of Jesus. You are called to live the life of the Spirit and to bear much fruit. No believer is exempt from the expectation of Christ that they will be faithful and active disciple in whatever capacity He has equipped us for. When the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, He appeared in the form of a flame small enough to rest on the head of each of the people He met there in prayer. Even if you've been on the sidelines, doing very little, or only engaging in the work of the church when someone specifically asked you to do a small task, one that you felt comfortable with, a very limited duration, required no commitment. If you know Jesus, the fire of the Holy Spirit has descended on you. And He waits only to be given full reign in your life. If that describes you, you can do more. And the Spirit has gifted you to do it in His power. 
All of us are sitting in this dark world and we're surrounded by the nighttime of sin and ignorance and rebellion against God. And we endure the resistance, perhaps even the ridicule or opposition of those around us. But Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He compared you to a city on a hill. A lamp in a dark room. Something that cannot be hidden. Something we should not even try to hide. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians, You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Inside every one of you in this dark world is a flame. And maybe it's already flaming and burning hard. Shining and radiating all over the place. If it is, praise God. Be encouraged. But most of us can afford to hear Paul's encouragement to Timothy. Fan into flame the gift of God. Nurse that ember. Coax it. Protect it. Encourage it. Cherish it. Feed it. Don't let it go out. Don't let it get dim. Don't let it cool. God has done something in your heart. And that something is not meant to be a unique experience in your life. It is meant to be the beginning of new and greater things. Growth. New adventures. New avenues of living into the life of Christ. Growing into His image. Maybe, maybe, what He did in your life over the last number of months didn't feel entirely positive. Look for the gem of truth and life in it. That's the spark. That's the ember. Don't let the cool breezes of this world overcome it. Find that experience, that word, that impression, that impulse that God has planted in your heart. Only you can know what it is and nourish it. Meditate on it. Pray about it. When you're reading the Scriptures, look for it. And when you're talking to other people, especially wise leaders and experienced believers, Share it. Write down some sentences and paragraphs about it in your diary or your journal. Find others who have that same ember. Trade notes. And as you understand it better and grow in confidence of its divine origin, try new things related to it. Today, it may only be a spark. It may only be an ember. Fan it to full flame. Burn brightly like a lamp in a dark room. And together, the people of God can reach the whole world with His light. Let's pray. Dear God, do not let us cool. Do not let us dim. Do not allow us, we pray, to ignore what you began in us. Let us not be like the person who thinks that a planted seed is all that's needed. But let us nourish it and water it and weed it 
and fertilize it and guard it and grow it because the seed is only the beginning. And a spark is only the beginning. And we confess that we might be a little afraid. What if we step out of the status quo? What if we, what if we try to do things that we've never done before? What if we face failure? What if, we, what if people don't understand? What if we're wrong? What if... What if But help us to embrace the lesson of the children. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. For you, the Lord our God, will be with us wherever we go. Help us to sink faith in that promise like a taproot. We ask you, dear God, that we would never be satisfied with just being Christians in name only, with an occasional experience that lifts us up to a mountaintop and then just walk away and, and walk the earth even like a non-believer. Help us to draw closer to you together do the work that you have for us to do in the power of your Spirit. Breathe on us, breath of God. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we have communion. For the first time in a long time, we're actually using the elements separately instead of in prepackaged cups. I'd just like to remind you, some of you may not have been expecting it, but we are continuing to use the, uh, the corn tortillas. They're, they're gluten-free. They're unleavened bread, as Jesus used at the Last Supper. Paul says, I am speaking to you as people who have enough sense to know what I am talking about. When we drink from the cup that we ask God to bless, isn't that sharing in the blood of Christ? When we eat the bread that we break, isn't that sharing in the body of Christ? By sharing in the same loaf of bread, we become one body even though there are many of us. Communion is such a complex thing. In it, we commune both with God and with each other. It's a proclamation of his death and it's a covenant with him. I'd like to invite the people who are serving to please come forward. Jesus commands us to take this meal. To do it to remember his death till he comes. The body that was broken for us, the blood that was spilled. Promising us that he was not even going to drink this wine again 
until we can all sit down physically at a table and drink it together with him. He's waiting for you. In the meantime, in the meantime, we have this sign. The sign of our covenant with him. The sign of his sacrifice for us. The sign of a shared belief and practice. Let's pray. Dear God, bless this bread. Bless this cup. We ask that it would do so much more then give us some trace vitamins and minerals that will flow through our body and strengthen us in some small way because they're only small portions. But what they signal would nourish our spirits, would cultivate the bond among us, would remind us of who we are in you. Bless this meal, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
said, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood given for the redemption of many. Feast on him in your heart and live. And I invite you to stand. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be. No place I would rather be than here in your love. Here in your love. I can't. 
love of God. Go this week looking for him at every turn, finding him as often as you may, allowing yourself to be changed into his image, glowing with the fire of the Holy Spirit.